Hi. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for end-of-life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so that we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It's time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives and to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care unit. Together, we can explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we can make this difficult conversation easier. Together, we can make sure that our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. If you're ready to join us, we ask you, navigate the journey. As you know, we are supporting legislation to have death with dignity or medical aid in dying made legal in Hawaii. The Senate bill is being heard at the Capitol as we speak. Therefore, I have invited Walter Peters, of course, a dear friend, who has experienced the real turmoil of the end of life of a loved one when that person had no options or choices. Today's guest, Walter Peters. Walter? Hi, Marcia. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for being willing to talk about something so sacred, so close to you. Sure, so, you're welcome. So tell us a little bit about you first. Oh, gosh. Well, <coughs> okay, a big the, bit then. The Reader's Digest version. So I was, okay. I was born in Santa Monica, raised in Southern California, Hawaii. I mean, a uh, beach boy, right? Surfing, hiking, and all that stuff. And, and I bought the... I bought the publicity when they said LA is the place. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it's the place. The mountains, the ocean, the forest, blah, blah, blah. But then when I was in the Navy, I came here and I was like, they lied. <laughs> this is, this the, is place. the place. <laughs> so uh, I moved here in 1991. Mm -hmm. uh, still the best decision I've ever made in my life. I just love living here. Um, I own two companies. One is a small remodel and repair business. I fix people's houses. Uh -huh. And the other is a coaching practice. So I consult with people about their mindset in the areas of sales or maybe executive management, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, okay. I, and I love to cook, so that's my thing. You know, I okay. get out my Rolodex. I, the first six people that say yes, that's my dinner party. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. You have special recipes you like? Um, I make them up. Oh. So, yeah, that's you know, good. it's like there's a few that I that I like old standards that I like, but I like I like discovering what I don't know about cooking. Oh. Come up with something new. Very yeah. good. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. great. Okay, I'll be there. <laughs> now, um, I've known Walter for what four or five years now. Well, let's see. It was 2012 we met. Walter yeah. and I sat next to each other. Yeah at a dear friend's husband's funeral. Right. And that's how we met. That's right. And so here we are again talking about the end of life. Right. Walter, Walter's sister, mm -hmm. is this correct? Mm -hmm. Your sister was terminally ill right. and she had all kind of stuff. So yeah. I want you to tell us well, all so, about your sister. So my sister, first of all, she saved my life so many times I can't even count. She was born when I was 12. And I was in a war with my mom, and my mom was winning, but I was still fighting, <laughs> right? And my sister was born, and, my, and, my, and I was just fascinated with this infant. And my mom goes, oh, this is your job now, <laughs> right? And so at the age of 12, now I'm dad, right? right. But, but I was not my own. I had support and all that. But it just transformed me. It really changed who I was being in life. And um, so she was there th for me throughout my life. I was there for her throughout her life. And then 2012, she had uh, breast cancer, and that was treated, and they did whatever they did, and she came away fine. Um, 2014, she found a soft spot in her head, and she went into the, the place, and they did a scan or whatever it was, and they determined that it was bone cancer, and it was oh. in her skull. But uh, for whatever reason, they didn't operate immediately. By the time they did operate, the tumor had migrated into her brain. 
so that when they did operate, they actually ended up removing a small portion of her brain. It turned out to be the part that controlled her left leg. So she went from being this vivacious, brilliant, active young woman to a wheelchair-bound patient for the oh. rest of her life. And uh, how so old was she? She was that was when she was 42. Oh. Okay. So then she uh, she, she she seemed like she was recovering. And then in Christmas of 2015, she, uh, she sneezed. She had a pain in her shoulder, and she hadn't gone in to have it looked at yet, but she was going to. She sneezed and snapped her collarbone because there was a tumor there. So they went through the whole treatment protocol again, radiation, chemo, all the things that they do for bone cancer. Um, and again, you know, she seemed to be recovering. She was getting better. Uh, I still have on my phone a voicemail that she left for me in July. Uh, and she was singing to me. She goes, I have no pain. I have no pain. This is your sister, and I have no pain. And, and that was in July. Well, in August, she and her husband were getting in the car, and she, um, her, her left uh, hip collapsed. And she, you know, she heard a snap and whatnot. So instead of going to the show they were going to go to, they went to the ER instead. And they did all their scans and what it was, and they said, well, you have a tumor in your hip, and it's so deep, and for us to go in and operate on it, it is not uh, necessarily safe because there's so many complications that could occur. And we can't do any of the treatments that we've been doing on you because we've depleted your body's immune system so much that there's barely anything left. So for us to, to do chemo and radiation would be probably lethal. Uh, the operation, we have no way of saying to you that it's going to be safe or that you'll survive it or that it would even work. So, you know, you need to go home and, and just be ready to pass. And so she did, and that was August. And, um, you know, we were in communication. I talked to her in September, and I told her I was getting things together to be able to go up there and be with her. And she said, well, hurry up and get here. And that's, that was a shocking thing to hear her say because I knew that she was telling me, there's not much time left. So, you know, I, I fortunately have a great community of whom you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so people pulled together and I got on a plane and, <clears throat> and I was there for the last month of her life. And, um, you know, the hardest part of it for me was just watching her deal with what she was going through because, you know, it was very painful. It was a really deep break right. inside the bone. So they had all these different medications. One, the, the primary medication was for the pain, but then she had three other medications to deal with the side effects of the medication for the pain. And they all had other side, side effects. effects. Yeah, and um, I'm sitting there, I'm watching this, this person who I know is my sister, but looks nothing like the, the brilliant, vivacious woman I've known her whole life. And she's you know, in discomfort, and she's, of course, grumpy because she's been in a wheelchair for two years already, right? And, you know, she's, like, irritated by the smallest things, right? And, um, and, and tremendous discomfort in her digestive tract, and her breathing was bad, and her throat would get congested, and it was just hard to well, watch now, her again, struggle. You said she was 42, 44? She, she was 42 when they found the... the uh, tumor in her skull. Right. She was 44 when she passed two years later. She had that torment for, for two years? Yeah. Well, oh. it wasn't always that bad, right? Oh. I mean, but there, whenever the, the treatment was going on, it was, it, was, it was just horrible, you know? I mean, and so, yeah, you know, there I was, and I just was about, how do I be of service here? How do I support her to get to whatever it is that's next for her? And I can't even tell you how many times she told me that she wished it was over. In fact, she and her husband shared with me that uh, before I got up there in October, she had gone to see one of her uh, oncologists. And during her visit, he turns and he looks at her and goes, you know, I, I can't believe you're still alive. Now, a doctor doesn't genuinely say that to you, right? <laughs> but that's what he was like, how have you lived this long? And it was, that was the thing. She was like, I don't know, doc. But I, I think it had to do with the fact that she was very active, very energetic. She, was, she danced. You know, she was a professional dancer for a while. She, um, she was a public speaker. She was a very high energy type of person, mm -hmm. and she was always really committed to organic foods and all those types of things. So I think she did had a good body yeah, going into this. She had done such a good yeah. job taking care of her body 
that it was in pretty good condition when these other things happened, and it just, it was just gonna, it was gonna last a while. Well, you know, when you mentioned what the doctor said, I've talked to so many patients since we've been doing the show, and they tell me that the doctors have no idea what to say. Right. Just, they don't know. Yeah. Now, one thing that, one thing that complicated her situation, where she and her husband live, is uh, 40 miles east of Ogden, Utah, oh. in, in a valley in the Wasatch Mountains. So, her hospice team is responsible for an area of about 250 square miles, right? So they have- Just one? It's one team. It's a, a physician, a nurse practitioner, and three others who I don't remember their titles, but they would all come and visit periodically. Right. Somebody would be at her house at least two or three times a week, mm -hmm. right? But they would say, well, we'll be there at one o'clock. But the truth of the matter is, wherever they were before, if it took them a little longer, there's nothing they can they do. They got to do. They got to mm -hmm. serve that client, and then they're on their way. So there's times they wouldn't get to her place till five or six thirty. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was that because the team was so spread out, and only certain people on her team were empowered to actually make treatment decisions for her, mm -hmm. that it would take. There was a, a delay between when a decision was made and when it got implemented, mm -hmm. and um, and towards the very end, you know, they 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 modified her medication like three times in two weeks while I was there, and uh, but there wasn't any way for someone to be there to monitor the impact of the new medical pro the new medication protocol they put her on, like to see how's that working, yeah. right? Because she was at home, it wasn't she wasn't in a right. facility, so that. That complicated things, and, and it was it was it was hard for her. It was really hard. So, she, uh, but but she was given regular sedation and pain meds. And they had yeah, they had pain medication. You know, I mean, she was uh, when I got there, she was on Dilaudid, and then they went to an oral morphine tablet, and then they went to a liquid morphine. Liquid. You know, with a, a drop of dropper. dropper. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> But um, all of those are opiates, right? And so all of them have the effect of clogging up the uh, digestive yeah. tract, mm -hmm. which meant she couldn't um, eat well, and and it was, she had a really hard time keeping food down yeah. when she did eat. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was it was. So was you tough. were there for until I was there a month. A month. Yeah. The last month of That's her life. The last month of her life. Yeah. And so you got to visit and talk and oh yeah. And Spend. Yeah. And then, of course, family and, and, and her husband's family is huge. And I mean, he's, he's from Utah? No, he's, they're actually both from Southern California, but his, his previous generation was from Utah. So his, his uh, father and his uncles and, and uh, grandfather, them, they're from uh, a place called Greenville. Mm -hmm. Which is in the south of Utah, and and that's and but that but where Annette and Danny were living was north and east of Salt Lake. Yeah. Well, we are going to take a break. Sure. And when we come back, I want you to, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. telling us about those last few. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Hello, my name is Crystal. Let me tell you, my talk show, I'm all about health. It's healthy to talk about sex. It's healthy to talk about things that people don't talk about. It's healthy to discuss things that you think are unhealthy because you need to talk about it. So I welcome you to watch Quok Talk and engage in some provocative discussions on things that do relate to healthy issues and have a well-balanced attitude in life. Join me. Aloha, I'm Bill Sharp, your host for Asian Review, a weekly um, show right here on Think Tech Hawaii that's devoted to substantive analytical discussion about contemporary events in Asia. By Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan and from the Russian Far East South to uh, Australia and New Zealand. Hi, we're back. And this is my dear friend, Walter Peters. 
And Walter has been telling us about the horrors that his sister went through living in Utah, which is basically a Mormon town, state, yeah. and without the choices and options yeah. that we here in Hawaii are, are working hard to see that our people do not have to go through what his sister went through, which is why I asked Walter yeah. to talk about it. Sure. Because from, for so many of us, it's just this piece of paper that says this is a bill, and then somehow we get to the end and say, oops, this is what this was about. Right. So, Walter, again, tell me, now your sister was 45? She was 44 years old. 44. Yeah. And she had? She had terminal cancer. cancer. She actually had three cancers. Three so, different cancers? So here's what it is. The breast cancer, even though they successfully treated it, it actually is never gone. Oh, yeah, I know it's that. It's still one. in the body, yeah, I, right? I know so that. she had that. She had bone cancer, which was very active and aggressive. And the third one, I'm trying to remember, oh, yes, it was on her lungs. And what it was is she'd had so many um, x-ray workups right. over the period of time she was in intensive treatment that the x-rays had actually caused lesions on her lungs which had made it really hard for her to breathe and to, to sleep well. And it had, it had metastasized the bone cancer, somehow had affected the lungs to where she now had a, a lung cancer going on. So yeah, so she had three, three cancers and any one of them would have taken her out eventually. Yeah, it's just hard to, to imagine yeah. what, what she went through. So now you, you stayed with her for a month. Right. Now tell us about this last part of the month of the, of the of her being. She had hospice. She had hospice. Yeah. And but it's not like what we know here where they they're there every day because we have so many. Yeah, hospice. actually, you know, it's a funny thing. The the Mormon um, community, right? They have so many different service organizations within their community structure that she had people coming by the house. These were not, you know, medical professionals. They were just folks who cared. Right. And they'd bring food and they'd do a massage and they'd help her, whatever it was. They'd clean the house, you know. I mean, without them, it would have been a lot worse because her husband, you know, wouldn't have been able to go work. Right. Right, and that's one of the things, one of the benefits of me being there for him was that he could go work and I could help take care of her. So, yeah, it was a community process for sure. Now, even though she had all these drugs, was it a peaceful passing? Was it? Well, a no, no. I mean, it was. She was tremendously uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is that, you know, bone cancer. It's. Um, it, it 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 just hurts being there. Yes. Right. And plus, she'd had a break in her bone. Right. You know, in August, and here we are in um, early October and nothing's been done about the break in the bone, right? So she can't, there's no position she could get into where she had zero pain without medication. So she was constantly on some medication. And, you know, we had all these different uh, apparatus, you know, a chair that moves and whatnot to try to hold her in a position that's the least painful and all that. But the bottom line is that she was always always medicated and the medication had impacts on her besides the one that was desired. And she was just suffering. I mean, I, I cannot count the number of times that she said to me, how long is it going to take me to die? She goes, I, I, because the doctors thought that she'd already be dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, she had been told at least three or four times that you've got three to six months to live. Right, yeah. and that was two long years ago. <laughs> two right? years. Oh my goodness! So, so because she's just like, how long is this going to take? How long do I have to go through this? How long do I have to do this suffering thing? So yeah, it just got to the point where you know, it didn't make any sense to to prolong it. If there was any way to make it happen sooner, well, that was the thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I think I need to make it clear to our audience that in this bill in the bill that's before the legislature now. It talks about the fact that the patient, not the doctor, right. not the family, right. the patient 
right. like your sister, right. can say, the cancer has eaten me up. Yeah. I am not taking my life. My, the cancer is taking my right. life. Yeah, it was, it was already, a, there was no because question about whether she was going to live or not. The only difference is how long is it going to take? It take. Yeah. And why should she have to suffer like that? Right. Why should her husband have to suffer? Right. Why should you have to suffer right. Right. like that? Yeah. And then, uh, that's just inhumane to make a person do that. Right. So, now, once she's in this, did they do terminal sedation? That's when well, they... Well, there is I, a, I don't there's, know if that, there, what there's they call an it. Option, there's an option for that. And um, you know, we have a mutual friend that's a retired right. nurse. And, of course, I was on the phone with her a lot, you know, mm. about what could we do and whatnot. And she was making recommendations. But, again, the hospice situation, right. the, the, the time delay between having a, a, an idea and a decision and a request and, a, and having it actually get implemented, that was unworkable. Um, so we, it just turned out that, um, that that might have been an option. And that's not how things turned out. We actually got into communication with an organization that's a, a national organization that, um, that assists people at the end of life. And, um, and they explained to us their process and what they do. And, uh, and, but they have all these protocols that they have to go through to protect themselves. Oh, yes. Because there's going to be somebody disgruntled about it. Yes. Right. So they have to they, they have to go through a whole bunch of uh, steps to make sure that they remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. And and uh, fortunately, we didn't have to go through all that. Um, but yeah, so it just yeah, but but they showed us how we could support her so that we could support her to, to get complete. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, just to explain to our audience that as the law stands now in Hawaii, mm -hmm. if a doctor uh, prescribes something mm -hmm. so, so that the patient can, in fact, right. end the suffering, uh, if there's a disgruntled person, right. the doctor might be charged with manslaughter. Right. So there's all, the bill protects the doctor. Right. And, you know, to keep, uh, it's just hard to believe that somebody would be charged with manslaughter when their intention is to assist this person to end the suffering. And in the bill, the doctor does not touch the patient. Right. The patient has to ingest it themselves. They have to do this. Right. Uh, so, I'm, I'm just back to your sister. Sure, sure, sure. So, so tell me. Did she find the video? How did? How was I, the end? Well, did you? I'm gonna walk. I'm gonna okay. walk discreetly. Okay. And um, she had assistance. Yes. And her end was peaceful. Oh, good. And um, her husband and I were there with her. And um, and the only thing I can say is that everybody was relieved that it was finally over you know there wasn't anybody going oh too bad no it was everybody was like thank you okay now what do we do we take care of what there is to take care of but um but yeah it was it was challenging um to just be in that space just be there with her as she's going through so much struggle and so much discomfort and and you can just see the agony that she's going through. I mean I don't I'm not even gonna get into the things that I needed to do for her to be able to breathe. It was just not I never want to see a thing like that again in my life. But that's what it took, right? But that was just so that she could get air. Not any you know, comforts, just to be able to breathe. I had to go through all sorts of things just to be able to clear her airway. It was, it was hard. So, so to be able to, you know, to know that she was uh, finally at peace was just the biggest relief. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I asked Walter to come yeah. so that we could hear firsthand 
this sort of thing, what it does not only to the patient but to the family. Because we want this bill to pass so that that people, what's her name? Annette. So that, that there aren't a lot of other Annettes. Yeah. We have to have it passed so that people... Well, don't. you know, here's the thing. This is what's so. Had there been legislation like what you're talking about in place there and then, her suffering could have been um, diminished tremendously, mm -hmm. and her actual end process could have been much more comfortable for her. And you. And, and, and us. And yeah. us. Absolutely. Could have been. But, uh, you know, that's just, that's not the case. Yeah. You know? And you've got people who, um, basically what, what the law currently says is, that doesn't belong to you. We will tell you when, when you, you can, go. You, we'll tell you when it's okay. Yeah. Versus, that's yours. Yep. Do with it what you will. What amazes me is that if you're in the hospital right. at ten thousand dollars a right. day, right. they can turn off the ventilator, right. which seems terribly cruel to yes. me. Or you can decide not to have food and water. Mm -hmm. <gasps> that that's just all of that seems cruel. Yeah. And or they can do terminal sedation, which right. is they give you some kind of a drug. Right. And then they keep drugging you till you, right. well, you're unconscious and you go. Right. Which, again, seems, if all of that is legal, then why is it not legal to allow a person to choose, give them, the doctor just writes the prescription, he doesn't touch. Mm -hmm. So if your sister had had that, and, and she said it would give her comfort to know right. that if I want this, if this becomes yeah. too hard, I have something. Right. And in the bill, you have a right of refusal. Right. If you order it, and then you say, I think I changed my mind, mm -hmm. you don't have to take it. Right. And it just seems so humane. And listening about your sister, uh, I just hope and pray that we, enough people, will write about Annette in the name of Annette and say we've got to pass this. Mm -hmm. We can't have another Annette. Yeah, well, yeah. the reality is that there's so many. There are. There are so many. And, um, you know, the way things occur right now, um, it's just not my experience. I mean, I'm not an expert, but it's not my experience that the patient is the highest priority. I just not how it looks to me when I see the system and what she went through. You know, it just uh, it doesn't doesn't show up to me like that. Her well-being, comfort, and peace were the highest priority in the system. It didn't show up to me like that. And you are yeah. correct. Yeah. And G. Walter, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you. And I can't help but cry. And thank you. Well, you're Thank welcome. Thank you so much. I hope we have an impact. Aloha.